My name is Noel Joseph Terence Montgomery Needham. I'm from Great Britain. My Chinese name is Li Yue Se. I have been to China nine times in my life and I am eternally grateful for everything I have learned there. Everywhere I have been able to witness its ancient spirit of science and technology. I feel privileged to have seen firsthand this wonderful creativity, the brightest of minds and the noblest of spirits. From this war-torn Asian country burst vitality that borders on the miraculous, it is in this land where such wisdom abounds that the second act of my life began. Cambridge University's Gonville and Keyes College is a master producing machine. Among its 15 Nobel Prize laureates is Stephen Hawking, a fellow of the college who passed away in 2018. On the walls are portraits of the deans of the college and its other academic luminaries. One man stands out from the others in suits and ties for wearing a Chinese robe in his portrait. This is Joseph Needham, who enjoyed world renown as a biochemical embryologist. When sitting for his portrait in 1964, why did Needham, the British biochemist, choose to wear a Chinese robe with a slide rule as a prop? This photo was taken in the 1940s. Upon the approval of the British government, Needham travelled to China to learn about its wartime education. On February the 25th, 1943, the day after he arrived in China, Needham rushed to a tailor to have a Chinese robe made up for himself. This is what he wears in the photograph. The gown was made of blue silk with broad cuffs. The tailor told him the purplish blue colour that he had chosen was popular among Chinese scholars. In his diary, Needham described his appreciation for such attire. I like their long gowns, giving a monastic look to the scene, and they put their hands in their sleeves in a quiet way, which is nice. It was already six years since Japan launched its full-scale invasion of China. Over those years, Japan had wreaked havoc on China's education system. 90% of China's 108 universities had been damaged. In an effort to preserve its cultural heritage, the Chinese government had just finished relocating universities and research institutions down to the southwest at the time Needham arrived. A total of four new educational bases were formed around Kunming, Chongqing, Chengdu and Lijuan.
After visiting Kunming, Chongqing and Chengdu, Needham arrived on a salt ship in Lijuan, the first town on the Yangtze River on June 3, 1943. The small town of Lichuang, no bigger than 7 km square, now accommodated several educational and academic institutions, including the Institute of History and Philology of Academia Sinica, Tongji University, and the Institute for Research in Chinese Architecture. All had moved from the east. Needham was probably unaware that he was about to meet some of the greatest minds in modern Chinese history. Sichuan sees a lot of rain in the month of June. Some rare sunny days can be seen from the photograph Needham took when he arrived in Lijuang in early June 1943. In the stream of people, students of that era can be vaguely discerned. From Needham's photos, we can see that local ancestral halls, temples and houses, had been transformed into lecture halls, classrooms and offices. The population of the town surged from 3,000 to more than 12,000. Hundreds of students and teachers from Tungji University finally found peace here, over a thousand miles from their original campus. At Li Chuan, Needham was eager to see his old friend Tung Di Zhou. Tongdi Zhou was a biology professor at Tongji University. He had studied in Europe in the 1930s and had been one of Needham's peers. His successful laboratory experiment in removing the 0.1 mm thick membrane of a sea squirt egg had excited his colleagues, including Needham himself, who had been watching the operation in person. The two were thus quite familiar with each other. In Needham's recall, Tung Di Zhou always surrounded himself with microscopes. In the early summer of 1943, Needham finally met his old friend in this makeshift College of Science. Needham was thrilled to take this photo of the two biologists, Tung Di Zhou and his wife, Ye Yufen. However, he hadn't expected that the famous biologist was doing his experiments under such Spartan conditions. In the sparsely furnished room, there were only a few beakers on the table, an old microscope and some pens and paper. Furthermore, he was surprised to find that Tung had to borrow money to buy his old-fashioned microscope from a street vendor. The 
看到有个德国菜式的那个总统显微镜，当时那老板说呢要一百大洋，那么当时我父亲，这就是比我父亲和我母亲两个人两年的工资还要高，就是我母亲，我母亲说是你不要急，我想法去借钱，呃，我们把这个买下来。Needham could hardly imagine that it was in such an environment that Tung Di Jo and his wife made significant discoveries, like the polarization of ciliary beating, coinciding with the latest discoveries in the top modern laboratories in the West. Seeing this crude research environment, a world apart from that in Europe, Needham compared his friend to a goldfish stuck in the desert. However, Tung took it lightly. He excitedly invited Needham to join him in the search for materials for his experiments. It was early summer in Lichuan, where lotus ponds and rice paddies were all lush green with vitality. Needham was curious to see Tung Di Zhou and his wife leading their students to catch frogs in the fields. Everybody, with their sleeves rolled up and basins in hands, was searching for frogs, goldfish and frog eggs in high spirit for experiment and research. Needham took this picture in front of Tung Di Zhou's lab. Needham once asked him why he chose to work in such a remote and underdeveloped village when he could be in a much better equipped laboratory in Brussels. Tung Di Zhou's answer was simple, because I'm Chinese. Cambridge's Needham Research Institute is home to most of Needham's photographs, books, letters, and his collection of record cards in the Chinese scholars he met. Here is Tung Di Zhou, and his wife, and his wife. He will speak to the French language, and he will also remember the first time we had a meeting in the 30s. We had a meeting in the 30s. What kind of research is VVG? VVG 是什么意思呢 ？VVG 是 very very good， 意思是他是非常高级的一个呃科学家。Over four years, Needham drew up more than two thousand cards recording the details of the Chinese scholars he came to know of. They made up almost the entire Chinese academic community at that time. Among their names is Liang Se Cheng, one of China's most famous architects. This photograph, taken by Needham, is of four Chinese scholars, with Liang Se Cheng at the center. Even before he came to China, Needham had long admired Liang Se Cheng and his institute for research in Chinese architecture. In those days, Liang Sechong and his wife, Lin Hui Yin, lived in the moon field on the outskirts of Lijuang.
In the early summer of 1943, Needham arrived at their small house in the Moonfield to meet with the legendary academic couple and visit the research institute. Needham was astonished by what he saw when he arrived. Liang Zicheng, this one of the Qian Qian soldiers, he was just trying to catch a fish, a fish that was just moving around, letting an outsider see it. He thought it was very strange. 实际上是梁先生拿出了家里边所有能招待的最后的、最好的一点东西了。The cold, damp climate had badly affected Lin Hui Yin's health, who was by then bedridden with lung disease. She met with Needham on this sick bed. Needham was impressed by her beauty, her fluent English with an Irish accent, and her witty conversation. Needham couldn't have known of the hardships that the pair had undergone. Liang Sichong suffered from spinal disease and could only sit upright with the aid of a metal corset. Nonetheless, aided by his equally ailing wife, he devoted himself to writing his volumes The History of Chinese Architecture and Chinese Architecture, a Pictorial History. These were two landmark works which were completed in the sleepy surrounds of Lichuan. This is an illustration made by Liang Se Chong of a large bowl of tomato and egg soup. Alongside he wrote, looking forward to having such a bowl of soup after victory. Victory in the resistance war against Japanese aggression was an ever-present concern for Chinese academia. The Chinese have a democratic sense of humor and lofty Confucian social ideals, Needham wrote in his diary. It is inconceivable to think that the Chinese would succumb to the Japanese imperialist invaders' temptation to surrender. It was early summer. Needham was soaked in sweat even though he was only wearing a thin khaki shirt and shorts. With delight and not a little pride, he delivered an acclaimed speech to students of Dongji University at Huiguang Temple, the main campus building of the temporary university. Needham spoke on hydraulic engineering management. As can be seen from this photo taken at the time, the students were fascinated. He said, Today is the first time of the Chinese Constitution. The old Constitution is the Great Yi. He 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 is the Great Yi. 科学家和中国的听众的情感一下子就拿尽了。
As Needham spoke for an hour, the faces of his audiences of students lit up with silent admiration. However, the triumph was short-lived, as he soon became embroiled in an argument with Fu Su Nian, then head of the Institute of History and Philology, Academia Sinica. The Lifeng Academy, home to the Institute of History and Philology of the Academia Sinica during the war, was on the outskirts of Li Tuang. The Institute, composed of four research groups on history, language, archaeology and anthropology, moved out of Nanjing and finally settled here after various twists and turns. Needham's encounter with historian Fu Sun Yen here was explosive. As Needham recalled, Fu, from Shandong province, was a man of about 55 years old. Slightly plump, with a distinguished face and grey hair, who talked a great deal. You said Ganduo However, this initial contretemps did not prevent Fu Sun Yen from introducing Needham to more ancient Chinese technology and culture. He took Needham to a grand mansion. It was the best liberal arts library in wartime China. Fu Sun Yen. 他就用他的各种各样的关系In this courtyard, Fu Sun Yen showed Needham a number of precious cultural relics. The Anyang oracle bones excavated before the war, bamboo slips full of Confucian classics and a variety of historic royal archives. Needham was overawed by the richness of the collection. He spent days in the library and immersed himself in a sea of antiques and books. Not far from the library is Osmanthus House, Fu Sun Yen's residence. During his time here, Needham and a number of Chinese scholars, including Fu Sun Yen, immersed themselves in ancient Chinese technologies, especially the history of gunpowder. Sleep often went by the board. It was likely these long nights of debate and conversation that later inspired Needham to begin his masterwork.
In the scorching Sichuan summer, Fu gave Needham a black folding fan, still among the treasured possessions at the Needham Research Institute. Fu Senian Zhu, that his own fan, by Lao Zi Dao De Jin, came a part of it, and was written to him. 送给他，一直保存到现在。山善若水，水善利益万物而不正。然后最后写了约瑟先生命，福四年。Needham likewise admired Fu Sunian. Forty-three years later, in 1986, before the military technology, the gunpowder epic of the seventh fascicule of science and civilization in China, volume five, was published. Needham inscribed the following dedication on the flyleaf. To the memory of Fu Su Nian, eminent scholar of history and philology, then at Li Chuang in Sichuan, and most friendly welcomer to wartime China who led a discussion one evening while we were there on the history of gunpowder in China. When Needham left China in 1946, Fu Sunyan commented, Needham knew us because of his passion. He did not despise our poverty and backwardness. He saw our patience he looked not at our underdevelopment, but at our future prospects. It was this sympathetic understanding of China's wartime predicament that did so much to patch up Needham's initial disagreement with Fu. Lushan City nestles at the confluence of the Minjiang, Dadu and Qingyi rivers. In addition to his time in Lijuan, Needham also visited Lushan to inspect the relocated Wuhan University. This is a series of photos by Needham of the local Confucian temple which became temporary home to the university's library. It was the most complete of China's university libraries during the war years. In 1938, when the Japanese bombed Wuhan, the teachers and students moved all their books from the university to Lushan. The Dajong Hall of the temple was emptied to house the tens of thousands of books that provided knowledge to students. Needham found that Chinese scholars' enthusiasm for study never disappeared in wartime. Even in a state of chaos, they never stopped learning. Classes could be found being held everywhere, in temples, in houses, and even in fields. In this photo taken by Needham, the second person from the left in a humble blue gown is Shi Shenghan, who had a doctorate in biology from Imperial College in London. Professor Shi Shenghan of the biology department at the Wuhan University became one of Needham's most important lifelong friends. Liu Shi went to Lushan. Basically, all of 
这个神圣爱情陪同他的，他还涉及很多专业词汇，包包括这生物学的，还有一些历史学的，这样词汇一般人都翻不了，所以神圣爱这方面给他提供很多的帮助。The first thing Shi Shenghan did when he returned to China from Britain was to order a long gown, just as Needham had when he first arrived in China. This photo by Needham is of a greenhouse made by Shi Shenghan. Needham was often amazed by the ingenuity with which he worked. We don't have a tree, we just use Chinese trees. We can use a very small tree, very small, very small. We can use the medical tree. We can use these to replace them. The medical tree is like the tree, the tree, and the tree. This is the tree. This is the tree. It's not difficult to find. So my father used to use the tree. The tree was hot. The tree was hot. It 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 was hot. 它不冷却，它就吸收那个水分嘛，就做一个干燥用。The Chinese people's resilience under the circumstances inspired admiration in Needham. On a wet day in early summer, Needham and Shi Shenghan met at the Shi Wang Watchtower. According to what Needham wrote in his diary, as they were chatting, Shi Shenghan spotted people walking in a line on a nearby narrow path and holding umbrellas over their heads against the rain. He turned to Needham and said, Look, a line of walking giant mushrooms. The vivid joke lingered long in Needham's memory. More than a decade later, Needham wrote on the flyleaf of Fascicule 1 on Botany of the Science and Civilization in China, Volume 6, to the memory of Shi Shenghan, Professor of Botany and Mycology, National Northwest Agricultural College, in gratitude for much inspiration and blithe discourse, and recalling Homomycetes that rainy day at Chia Ting. Leaving Lushan, Needham headed for Yibin. Shi Shenghan was happy to accompany him. While they wound their way down the Minjiang River by boat, Shi Shenghan recited the Song Dynasty poem, Listening to the Rain, by Zhang Jie. Touched by the patriotism and nostalgia of the poem, Needham translated it into English so that he could read often. As a young man, listening to the girls in a tower, I heard the sound of the rain while the red candle burned dim in the damp air. In middle age, travelling by boat on a river, I listened to the rain falling, falling. The river was wide and clouds drifted above. I heard the solitary cry of a teal born on the west wind. And now, in a cloister cell, I hear the rain again. My hair is grey and sparse. Sadness and happiness separation and reunion all seem one they move me no more let the rain drop all night on the deserted pavement till the day dawns needham marveled at the optimism serenity and persistence of the chinese scholars he met under such grim conditions He kept pressing the shutter of his camera to record everything he saw. The young man in Needham's photo is a junior researcher at the Physics Institute of the National Academy of Pei Ping. Despite Japanese bombardment, they were grinding optical glass into accurately calculated lenses for microscopes and telescopes.
experimentation on wind tunnels at the Tsinghua University was still ongoing. The planting and cultivation of seedless cucumbers continued. Research on astronomy carried on. Even the curious children were captured on camera by Needham. Needham's sympathy for the war-torn country turned to respect. He had witnessed the integrity and patriotism of the Chinese people, who believed that on war-torn land, streams flow and mountains stand, and that as Chinese people, they shall devote their lives to the cause of the nation. To this end, Needham set up the Sino-British Science Corporation office to aid the Chinese scientific community. Liu Sibo was from 1943 to China. In the summer, he founded a special center called the Chinese Science Corporation. This is the building of the Chinese Science Corporation. The two words are the two words. There was just such a quantity of material, and the material was wonderfully detailed. I mean, he would say, such and such a scientist in such and such a university, he wants a lot of um, test tubes, he needs test tubes for his experiments. So-and-so needs information on the latest this and that. The, this one needs um, the latest uh, journals, and this one, could we perhaps publish his articles in British journals? We must set up a way of, of making this happen. Needham's books and periodicals, transported for thousands of miles from England to China, provided those wartime scholars with the most advanced scientific and technological information from around the world. Today, those books are well preserved in many university libraries in China as a testament to that period of history. After his years of research and exchanges with Chinese scholars, Needham felt that the Chinese had succeeded in building a wartime science outpost in Western China. Between 1943 and 1946, Needham provided China with more than 6,000 books, nearly 200 periodicals and about £60,000 worth of experimental equipment. A total of 139 papers by Chinese scholars on subjects ranging from mathematics to chemistry were submitted to international journals through Needham. The spirit of masters never dies. Needham saw and helped preserve, in a way, the greatest of creativity, brightest of minds, and most precious spirit of China. In 1946, Needham compiled his experiences in China into a book titled Science Outpost. He wrote in the book no great insight is needed to see the initiatives, the sacrifices, the endurances, the faith, and the hope of a whole generation. Today's outpost can, in future, become tomorrow's overall command center. However, Needham was perplexed. Why, given China's long history of technological innovation and inventiveness, had a modern type of science and technology 
failed to develop in China, as it had in the West. He was to spend the rest of his life trying to answer this question.